Welcome to another episode of The Way I See It. I feel like it's been a long time, basically because I think the last couple of episodes have been kind of not the norm, so to speak. I did an interview, and then, and then after that, I don't think I did, I did the, the Life in a Day episode, and then the intro music episode. I don't think I've done another one where I really was talking about a concept. It's been like over a week, I feel like, since I filmed something like that. Uh, to the point that coming into this evening, I was kind of nervous. I was like, I don't really want to do it. I mean, I've got so much things I want to talk about, but I'm kind of nervous. Like, am I going to be able to organize my thoughts? Am I going to make any sense? So here goes. I hope I do. The first thing I want to talk about tonight, and this may connect to hope it'll all connect. I always hope it'll all connect. I always wonder going into each episode if the things I talk about are going to seem non-sequential or if they're all going to link together. So hopefully this will be the same. I'm going into this episode feeling the same way, so hopefully it'll make sense and it'll all connect. In light of all the racial unrest that's been going on, <laughs> been saying that for the past two months in light of all the racial unrest. One of the things I've been seeing going around on the internet is talking about how Jesus was black and Jesus was a revolutionary and Jesus did radical things and then he got crucified by the government. First of all, going to Jesus' race, it doesn't matter what his race was. The reason it doesn't matter to us today is because his race could have been any race, but it was going to be the race of Abraham. Because what Jesus was doing, he wasn't coming on the scene and just revolutionizing the way people behaved. Even in the Jewish system, they were not accurately living out the law because no one could. The point of the law was to show us our sin, that we couldn't uphold the law. We couldn't do all the things God wanted us to do. So when Jesus stepped on the scene, he was showing first his own people and then the rest of us after that, the true face of God, the true love of God, the true nature of what God thinks is important. But the point is his race was the race of Abraham. It was always going to be the race of Abraham because he was the fulfillment of his primary reason in coming was to fulfill the covenant that God had made with Abraham to, to make things right between God and man, and then to extend that out from, from Abraham's natural family to all of those who would believe. And I've said this in a previous video, people who believe in Jesus as the Messiah are the true children of Abraham, not people who are just the descendants of Abraham by birth. Paul says that explicitly in Galatians. I'll put that scripture <laughs> scrolling along right here. He also says it in Romans 4, I think. So Jesus' race was directly tied to Abraham's race. And we see in scripture that Abraham's race wasn't that important per se because we see when Abram was living in Ur, he wasn't holy. He wasn't pursuing God. God just came to him and said, look, I'm, I'm the God of all creation and I'm going to make you and all of your descendants my chosen people. He just unilaterally decided that. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, starting in verse 6, for you are a people holy to Yahweh your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is, a, he is the faithful God keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. So God just 
set his affections on the nation of Israel. They weren't special. They weren't special other than they were that they were special to him. They were made special by him. And so out of that comes Jesus. So, so that says to us, none of us is special because of our skin color. Not, every single person on the face of this earth is special because they were made by God. And if you're, cons if you're a Christian, if you feel like God has called you into a relationship with him, you're special because of that. Because he has set his affection on you and that Jesus died for your sins. You're not more special if you're victimized. You're not more special if you're dark-skinned because, you know, Abraham and Jesus had dark skin. None of that is what makes us special. You know, Paul had words with Peter. I've done that in a previous video. Link right there. Paul had words with Peter over racial divisions among the early Christians and how there should be no cultural barrier we're all saved by the gospel. We're all one in Christ. I mean, he railed on the, the whole book of Galatians is about that. So that's my first point, that Jesus, who, who, who cares what his race was? It has no meaning deeper than skin. It has no meaning deeper than the skin color. And today it, it makes no difference because skin color has nothing to do with who's in the family of God. Nothing. Jesus doesn't look at any one person and say, you're more special to me because you look like me. I have dark skin like you. That makes us closer. You know more about what it's like to relate to me, Jesus, the Christ, because of your dark skin color. That's, that's anti-biblical. There's, there's not a kernel of truth there. Now I'm going to try to connect this into my next thing which is something that's broader than race. A lot of the problems we see today stem, I believe, <clears throat> from the fact that we are made, we are wired to want to belong to something greater than ourselves. But that wages war with our desires inside of us to idolize ourselves. Go back to the first sin in the garden. The problem was that they were selfish. They they, they looked at the fruit and the, and the serpent said, you'll be like God. You'll, you'll know the difference between good and evil. And God just doesn't want to share that with you. And they're like, hey, you know, I want that. And that fruit's going to make me wise, tastes good, looks good. Why shouldn't I have it? And they went for it. So there was that selfishness and that permeates everything right up to today. So we want what we want for ourselves as individuals above everything. But on the flip side, we want to belong to something. And if people don't belong to churches or civic clubs, they'll go out and join, you know, riots. <laughs> they'll go join Antifa. People are going to join something. They'll join TikTok. They'll try to get a million followers on Instagram. It's this rise. It's like this simultaneous rise of belonging, belonging, belonging without actually being part of some sort of fabric of a community. It's all online. Or, or joining a bunch of strangers and marching in the street to vaguely protest something which is slightly different for every single person in every single town doing these protests because everybody, again, has their own individual ideas. So they want to do that, but, but, but on the flip side, there's the rise of individuality. It's this constant, and, and it's just, they can't both win. They can't. Everything will break down. There's a quote that I posted that I'm now going to post here while I'm talking about it uh, from C.S. Lewis talking about how hell is basically where everybody is ultimately selfish. And if you feel like right now things in this nation are becoming like hell on earth, check the mirror, man. We are, we are living in a time where every single person has a grievance all the time. And if you've ever read The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis, it expands on that theme of that quote. It, it basically, all these people go to visit heaven and one by one, they choose not to stay. It's kind of like they're in purgatory and they get to see heaven and they get to choose whether they're going to stay or not. It's not meant to be, you know, solid biblical truth. It's just a, a story, a imagine, if you will, kind of thing. But ultimately, 
each of them has a selfish reason why they don't want to stay. It's, and it just comes down to the fact that they just can't forget about themselves and focus on God. They just can't let go of their desire to want things their way or want God to answer their questions or want God to answer to them for what he did that upset them in life. And it's like, if, if God, I could never bow the knee to somebody like that. And they choose to go back. They all go back to hell, one by one. That's what I'm seeing in the nation today. It's becoming like hell on earth because everybody's got their grievances and they just can't let them go. They just can't look with love at other people around them and just show love. I just finished reading The Hiding Place and the story is amazing. And I'm like, how on earth did they act in love in this horrible, deplorable situation they were in in a concentration camp. Now I'm going to try to tie this one more time to like a third little thing here. <clears throat> and that is to go along with individualism here in the, in the West is existentialism. In an overview from Wikipedia, <laughs> it says existentialism is a tradition of philosophical inquiry that explores the nature of existence by emphasizing the experience of the human subject, not merely the thinking subject, but the acting, feeling, living human individual. It's a philosophical theory or approach which emphasizes the existence of the individual person as a free and responsible agent determining their own development through acts of the will. And you see this at play in like Disney movies. I mean, in the second Frozen, she's on this journey. She's trying to find this secret voice, you know, this thing that's calling to her. And in the climactic song, the climactic moment when she makes her way to like the inner sanctum of the, you know, to find the spirit that she's been looking for, the voice of her mother sings, you are the one you've been looking for all of your life. Everything you want is found in yourself. All of the answers are in you. I previously did a video way back a few months ago, way back a few months ago. <laughs> I saw something the other day that was saying 2020 has simultaneously been the fastest and the slowest year on record. <laughs> and it's true. There have been times where you just feel like it's just crawling and then you blink and you're like, how is it already August? But I'll put the link to that right here. I titled that video, You're Not Enough. And I didn't get that idea from Allie Beth Stuckey, even though she has a book that just came out and she's talked about it on her much more popular show and podcast, talking about how you're not enough. But really, that, that idea just comes from this existentialism that is just, it is all over the country. And it's not just, you know, being taught in secular world. It is in the church. And that is why the church is having such a struggle right now with, with all of these issues. And we can't seem to, to come together. It's because we can't, stop looking at ourselves like in the great divorce and look to God. Everything is about each individual person's, you know, manifestation of my best life now and, you know, reaching the top of the triangle of the self-actualization. As Christians, we cannot try to take the Bible and fit it into that worldview. We have to say, you know what, that's a worldview that maybe I'm automatically operating in and not realizing it and I need to step back. I need to step back and look at that worldview, and then I need to look at Scripture, and I need to let Scripture take precedence. I need to let God and what God says about himself in Scripture and how we relate to him, that needs to come first. I mean, it's so prevalent in the way we sing songs in church about how fulfilled I am in God. and It's true that we, we can be ultimately fulfilled in God, but if we come to God just expecting the fulfillment that we think we should have based on what the world says fulfillment looks like, we're putting that existentialism over scripture. We're not arranging ourselves correctly. We need to go to scripture. Remember, you don't go to scripture to look at what can, what can the Bible tell me about how to live my life. The Bible is not the playbook for life. We first have to go to scripture to see God. Who is God? What is he like? And what is he doing? Secondly, we need to realize, based on what I said earlier about how he chose Israel out of, 
out of nowhere for no reason other than he set his affection on them. Our self-worth and who we are and who we're meant to become is not found within us. We don't determine that. We need to look to God first to determine our identity. And everybody's made up their own identity in this world. And that's why we have all these conflicts right now. Because everybody wants their identity to be recognized and respected. And they're going to set out there and make their way in the world. I'm going to determine, I'm going to be the master of my own fate. They can believe that, but if you claim to be a Christian, that can't be your M.O. You're not a Christian if that's your M.O. Or maybe you're a Christian, but you're just confused and you need to, you know, get your head right. When we take the existentialist mindset and we determine our own identity, it's not going to be found in Christ because it's going to be selfish. It's going to be something that's focused on ourself, whether that be your race, which seems to be the biggest one right now, or your job, your family, or your culture, you know, your nation. Like if you say, well, I, you know, I'm an Italian. That, that's, that's my main identity. Well, I'm a Southern American girl. That's my main identity. And we start to determine, we start to immerse ourselves in some sort of identity that is not Christian. I'll wrap up with my favorite verse, my life verse, Galatians 2.20. My email address has get that in it, rggal220. RG is Rachel Green, because that used to be my name before I got married. I was Rachel Green before Jennifer Aniston on Friends. rggal220, Rachel Green, Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20 has been a favorite verse of mine for 20 years or more. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Let that be every Christian's heart cry. When you look to other Christians from other countries, other cultures, other races, you should see them as your dearly loved brothers and sisters ahead of people from your own race, your own country, your own culture who are not Christians. Your identity in Christ has to be the first and foremost. Oh gosh, I've said it before. I'm probably gonna end up saying something like that in about every episode. So I feel like right now in America and in other Western cultures, I mean, it's just such a foreign concept because we just cannot see how the tentacles of existentialism have just reached into our brains and just tainted everything we think and everything we see. Thank you for watching today. Please take time to like and please subscribe. Thank you so much. See you later.